before we proceed, just to check, are you hearing me clearly? Yes, hearing you. Yes, Great, sir. thank you. Thank you, thank you. So, as would have been indicated in whatever forms of communication that you've got for today's session, Today is another panel discussion and uh, the topic that we will be looking at is, uh, is uh, on security research and we are asking the question, is Jamaica ready? Today's panelists that we have uh, with us today are or Dr. Junjan Mansing, Dr. Curtis Busby Earl, Major Coraline Barclay and Dr. and Mr. Damien Cox. I do hope to have a fascinating and an engaging discussion with these or panelists with us today. Before we go any further though, let me just have a moment of gratitude. Uh, let us pray to our Heavenly Father. We just wanna say thank you. Thank you for this opportunity, thank you for this moment as we are gathered in such a fashion to discuss matters of security. I do pray for receptive minds and, and, and fulfilling and fruitful discussions, whatever I feel of asking. Pray that you fail not to grant it unto us according to your measures, amen. Thank you. So as was stated, we will be having a panel discussion and I gave a quick, run through of who our panelists are today. And uh, without much delay, let me start off with a brief introduction of who Dr. Curtis Busby Earl is. So Dr. Busby Earl is a senior lecturer in the Department of Computing. His primary interests are in the field of data and software security, along with requirement engineering. He has recently begun exploring quantum computing and its potential impact in data and software security. He has a number of publications in his primary areas of interest, including publications with his research students. He established and leads the department's computer intrusions, forensics and exploitation research group and Dr. Busby is also a certified ethical hacker from the International Council of E-Commerce Consultant in the USA, certified in creating computer security incident response teams from the Software Engineering Institute of Carnegie Mellon University. And in 2020, certified in the architectural algorithms and the protocols of a quantum computer and quantum internet from the Delft University of Technology in Netherlands. So we see where Dr. Busby Earl is quite knowledgeable within the space and is looking to expand some more. So with further, without any further delay, let me just ask Dr. Busby Earl to give us a brief synopsis of his um, thoughts around the topic, uh, about 15 minutes on his thoughts around the topic. Dr. Busby Earl. Thank you very much, Chair. 15 minutes sounds like a long time, but um, <laughs> whether or not Jamaica is ready for research in cybersecurity, correct? Well, I certainly think we are. We have the resources, we have the intellectual capability within Jamaica. Uh, for a number of years, I, I think we've been, we've had that capability. The, the legal space as well in recent times, and in recent times, most Specific, more specifically, I would say, with the recent um, revision, that's, that's the ongoing revision to the Cyber Crimes Act, the incoming or expected, well, so, uh, sorry, it's, it's already been enacted, the Data Privacy Act, but it's, we're in this uh, period of a 
uh, sort of a leeway where we're giving companies to get themselves prepared for it. And with other upcoming changes that the government is uh, implementing like NIDS, which has also been something that's uh, been widely discussed and presented in many forms of, of, the, of the media. We, I think, are more than ready. We have the local institutions that will be able to offer and already in many cases, and certainly in the case of, of my university, the UWI, to engage in research in the field of cybersecurity. We have been doing so for a number of years and will continue to do so. And I know as well, not just at Mona's campus, but at our sister campuses in Cape Hill and Trinidad, that they are also uh, members of our academic staff and their students who are actively engaged in research in the field of cybersecurity. So most recently uh, at the sister campus in Trinidad, for example, there was a, a student who successfully defended a uh, thesis in the area of steganography. Uh, here at Mona, one of my students recently uh, successfully defended his thesis in the area where he applied machine learning to the detection of botnets. And there are others who generally have that interest. There are a number of institutions, as I said, that uh, could offer these types of uh, research activities. Internationally, there are a number of institutions that also do it. But I think where Jamaica is going and that path in some way, form, or fashion has already been made public. Um, and another example is the e-currency that is to be um, adopted by the, the central bank. That's also, to come, that's also well, uh, I think, in, in some state of, of, of advanced deployment. And so the, the time is, is right and the resources are there. The interest certainly is there. The professional space has also expanded. There are a number of companies locally that are engaging in uh, activities such as penetration testing and the like. And so definitely, yes, I think Jamaica is ready to engage in research in the field of cybersecurity. Thank you, Dr. Busby Earl. Uh, next introduction to our panelists would be our Dr. Gunjan Man Singh. And I'll just give a brief um, introduction to her before she comes is that Dr. Man Singh is the head of the department and the senior lecturer at the Department of Computing at the University of West Indies Mona campus in Jamaica. And she holds a PhD in information systems and she teaches various courses at the undergraduate and the graduate level in computer science, information systems and data science, including business intelligence, programming, artificial intelligence, data visualization and knowledge discovery and analytics. She's the deputy chairman of the National ICT Advisory Council, which advises the Minister of Science, Energy and Technology. And she is the chairman of EGOV Jamaica Limited. She's a co-author of the book, Business Intelligence for SMEs and Agile Roadmap for Sustainability. She is a co-editor of an edited book titled Knowledge Management for Development Domains, Strategies, and Technologies for Developing Countries, Springer Integrated Theories in Information Systems. So we see where our Dr. Mansing is well-versed into the technology field and the cybersecurity. So at this time, 
let me ask Dr. Mansing to give her introduction. Um, I don't want to say 15 minutes. I don't want to scare her. Like, no, I, oh. <laughs> thank you, Giovanni. Thank you. And I, I would like to make a little correction to what you said. You know, if you read the profile, my bio, I'm not really an expert in cybersecurity. The, I am more a data scientist, uh, machine learning uh, researcher. But in my department, the, you know, the main cybersecurity researcher is Dr. Busbiel. And if I can just use his first name as I, Curtis. Um, so I am really looking at this whole, you know, and the whole nature of cybersecurity research in this entirety and not so much as to what is happening in the domain, which Dr. Basbiel will focus a bit on. I want to just, you know, just think back as to the era that we are living in. We are living in this world where, you know, it's technology is not in just how we work, but we live, how we sleep, how we communicate with each other, how we do everything, technology is there. And hence, you know, this, uh, this notion of security and securing our data becomes very important. Even, even organizations like uh, Pentagon have realized that they cannot manage all of the cybersecurity that is happening in their country. So they are relying on this notion of white hat hackers, which are the ethical hackers, which uh, Curtis is certified to be. And also, you know, this whole, the several companies are engaged in these bug bounties where they have students working on projects. So they have people who are like technology geeks who are literally working on projects like that. So we do understand that uh, as, as Jamaica, the Jamaican government or the entity itself cannot really satisfy what it means to do cybersecurity. And hence we have to look at that entire ecosystem as to who are the players who are really, you know, who can do the research and those would be also your you know, tertiary institutions and UV being one of them. Now, from a from you know from a uh, researcher at UV, I think there are some things that we would have to see if Jamaica has in place. We will have to see if you know the universities or the researchers, I should say, generically have access to the right infrastructure. You know, do they have sandboxes where can they can do their malware testing? Do they have uh, infrastructure where they can uh, apply? They can, you know scalability that they are applying something to a subnet, and when they were to apply it to the whole network, it would scale. Whatever tools and technologies that they are doing, so they have an environment like that for the researchers to enable that. I, I think with the new changes in regulations, that is possibly likely to happen. But this whole world of bug bounties uh, um, and uh, white hat ethical hacking is right now, I think, lacking in the Jamaican context. And if our researchers and our students, I think they should not live in the fear that there's going to be a police knocking on the door, which was actually said in one of our discussions when we had had on cybersecurity issues happening in Jamaica. So yes, the new cybersecurity, Cyber Crimes Act needs to take into account that there are other players in the market and everyone should not be treated as miscreants. And I think that becomes very important. Then, you know, so the, I would say the infrastructure, the, the regulations, and lastly to me, data. I think data drives a lot of research, you know, the data within our community. And uh, Giovanni, if I even looked at the data you had presented at the opening of Cybersecurity Week, the numbers were in two digits that what were reported. Um, and I'm sure the actual occurrences of these are much, much larger. You know, we, it's, it's everyone deals with their own issues in a hushed manner and there's no global way of, in Jamaica of sharing and even understanding what the problems are in the security space. You know, we always hear about the jobs that are needed and this, you know, the research that is needed, but we don't, we are not communicating within this environment to really have this conversation going. And I think if we were to say we are ready, not just the technical aspects that yes, we have the technical expertise, we have the PhD students, I meaning Dr. Basbiel just had his PhD student, you know, graduate last month, he had his viva and he was looking at botnets, um, and, and using machine learning in, in these botnets. But then again, the data set that he was using was an external data set. We don't have our local data sets or applying what he did in his research to our local data sets. So to make research relevant, we have to connect all these dots. And I think that's how I see that, you know, whether we have all this in place for the researchers in various institutions to actually carry on their job. Thank you, Dr. Mansing, for 
other panelist uh, for today is our major Carleen Barkley. And uh, Major Barkley is a multifaceted professional with over 25 years of experience spanning private and public sector and academia. Her professional life, her professional life reflects a strong nexus of technology, cybersecurity, privacy, policy, and the law, where she continues to, to make significant contributions. The major co currently holds the portfolio of the Director of Emerging Caribbean Institute of Cyber Secure Science, Caribbean Military Academy. This institution is intended to be the leading cybersecurity education, training, and research center for military and civilian personnel for the country and the rest of the region. She has successfully managed diverse data protection, governance risk and compliance, and vulnerability and penetration testing projects for international clients. As an educator, she designed and implemented University of Technologies School of Computing and Information Technologies first graduate program and master's degree in information systems management. Major Barclay is a trained legislative drafter and former parliamentary counsel at the Office of the Parliamentary Council, Ministry of Justice, Jamaica. She's also an active researcher who has published in leading, who has published in leading information systems and project management journals on areas including cybersecurity, cyber crimes, and project success. At this time, Major Barclay, the floor is open to you. Thank you, Giovanni, and good afternoon, everyone. Are you hearing me clearly? Yes, we are. Okay, great. All right, so um, my intent is to probably put a different spin on the discussion and uh, maybe tie uh, the area of cybersecurity research because it is open to interpretation as to the scope of what that means. Um, so I agree with uh, the previous panelists as to the question as to whether or not cybersecurity research are we ready in Jamaica? Like it's a definite yes, and I think the research has been, you know, been going on for years. It is just the type of research and the level of awareness for the requisite public. So in trying to frame the narrative and put things in context, it's also important to recognize that there are options for certain categories of cybersecurity researchers outside of the perceived legislative restriction. And I'll come to that later because oftentimes when we talk about cybersecurity researchers, especially uh, bug bounty and all of that, we tend to think that legislation is restrictive. I tend to hold a different view, but uh, in, Appreciating what cybersecurity research is, I hold the view that there are two compartments or components. There's a risk discovery for which um, talks about the investigation and searching for security flaws and, and bugs for which many persons tend to automatically think that is the de facto meaning of cybersecurity research. And of course, then there's the other elemental branch which considers knowledge discovery and building which is really the scientific inquiry into addressing um, cybersecurity issues and opportunities for which many academics um, tend to actually be actively in the, um, engaged in. So I think for both branches, uh, Jamaica, to some extent, uh, is somewhat started at with different level of maturities in that regard. I must also note that the current draft um, national cybersecurity strategy contemplates both perspectives and recognize the importance of leveraging various forms of research to cultivate a rich culture of building cybersecurity uh, resilience and also to foster innovation and development because without research, regardless of the form, once it is rigorous and robust, then there's a likely chance that we can foster innovation and development. In looking at the common perspective as to cybersecurity researchers, which we consider the white actors or the good faith actors or security researchers, 
these jobs are whose job is to find bugs and security flaws and attempt to penetrate systems in order to make them secure. Uh, across different jurisdictions, they have been operating in somewhat of a gray area uh, because some perceive that their, their law is written that in such a way that may expose them to work, um, to their work to prosecution. And we have a couple evidence of that, um, you know, if we should look in the cyberspace. However, there's an alternative side where we look at organizations who are taking the lead, not necessarily waiting on government or allowing the legislative, perceived legislative restriction to hinder them. Uh, by encouraging these um, ethical actors to privately inform them about the security bugs. And in return, the companies fix these systems and pay the actor for their work, hence the term bug bounty. Uh, so we have examples of that on the international space. I think, um, for example, Telsa in 2008, some time ago, tweeted that as long as your work complies with our bug bounty, um, then your warranty will not be voided, for example. Uh, however, on the other side, the flip side, there are companies um, that, of course, do not welcome the scrutiny and they do not like to have their uh, security vulnerabilities be a public um, issue. And we have examples of that um, internationally too, where we have talk space, for example, threatened to sue a security researcher over a bug report. And this was reported last year. And similarly, when we had our security or jam COVID um, event, there was talk of possible prosecution too. Um, I'm not sure if that has gone anywhere. But if we should take a bit of a step back and look at the Cybercrime Act, um, it talks about what, you know, how we constitute authorization or um, authorized use. Uh, they talk about, you know, entitled to control the access modification use or function of um, the kind in question, which is a computer. But it also says does not give consent for the access modification use or function of the kind in question from any person so entitled. And I think I want to zone in on this particular part because if it is that the researchers are acting in good faith, there should be no concern or should be no issues or hurdles in seeking consent um, from certain organization and be able to establish what we call a vulnerability disclosure policy and programs. So I think organizations can take the lead in that re regard. Maybe private um, sector will take the lead before public sector comes on. But again, these are contemplations uh, for the current revision of the cyber, um, the cyber security strategy. So let us look at what we consider the vulnerability disclosure policy and the importance of it, because it's important for uh, persons in this cyber ecosystem to recognize that this is an avenue that they can pursue and it has their um, good fruits in other jurisdictions. So in the absence of a supportive legislative framework, um, these vulnerability disclosure policies are common. It's a common approach that organizations can adopt as it encourages good faith research. And we can't uh, repeat that too much. It's good faith research, um, discovering and reporting of vulnerabilities in websites and other internet accessible systems or services. And I think once an organization have a strong cybersecurity culture, and is interested in fixing their issues, then I can't imagine that there would be too much of a challenge. Of course, you may have a few that are not ready or at that stage, but we can focus on those that are so ready. And it's important to note that regardless of what, um, you know, once you develop that, that policy in terms of reference, it's important for the researcher to abide by those terms and ensure that their scope of testing is, is, is so authorized. Otherwise, they will risk um, not having that bounty and probably even have um, risk of prosecution. 
So there are different types. Um, you have the private disclosure, you have full disclosure, and you have a coordinated disclosure where organizations such as CISO in, um, in the US, which is, if I remember right, Cybersecurity Infrastructure and Security Agency has a particularly coordinated disclosure approach where it facilitates a blend of the private and full disclosure because the intent is really to ensure that we build resilience while minimizing cybersecurity risk. So the more we can find those early warnings and fix them, the better it is for us. Uh, so that is the side of the cybersecurity researchers in terms of ethical actors. Now the cybersecurity researchers from the scientific inquiry perspective for which many academics have been involved in that field for quite a while. So it is recognized that the body of cybersecurity is vast. Um, oftentimes when we think of cybersecurity, we tend to go to the technical sides of the penetration testing, the, act, the attacks and defensive, behavioral, be, uh, adversarial behaviors and forensics, for example. And those are valid because there are so many different components. But there's also the human and organizational and regulatory aspects that we have to contend with. So when we think of conducting or undertaking scientific research, we also have to be mindful of these components. So we can have a holistic approach in building the nation's resilience and organizational resilience also. So and also talking about the strategy, the strategy uh, attempts to contemplate this within terms of promoting research and development and the draft currently proposes an establishment of a research fund to support it on the taking of uh, the national cybersecurity priorities. It is of course understood that this will take some time in terms of identification of the priorities and having the necessary funding to support these type of research. So, uh, you know, and some of the key topics outside of our general ethical actors, you know, we have the rising ransomware threats, you know, that I would consider a priority. So understanding some of the risks associated with that and what organizations can do to minimize threats. We see other jurisdictions that have been leading in terms of their type of research in that area. Every so often or every day, you see some ransomware guidance as to what um, these organizations can do. The question is why it is not coming from Jamaica too. You know, we can be able to develop these things. Inside of threats is a common thing. The importance of education and awareness. Is Major, uh, so I think you have given us a, a whole mouthful to, to absorb. Oh, you're stopping uh, me, Giovanni. <laughs> yes, just for a moment, oh. because we need to we need to start getting into the, 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 the details of what you have given us so far. And we we appreciate all that you said. And, 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 and Giovanni, it, I passed my 15 minutes. <laughs> I, I, I think we I, I, I like the direction in which. OK, no problem. Gone. So we we have quite a bit to work with, um, but you have you have started on a line that I think it's, it's a good place for us to start. And I'll throw a specific questions at our representatives from the university, because you asked, why is some of these um, activities that we're seeing in the cyberspace, in the security space, such as our, 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 our ethical hacking and these things, and we have our, our, our technological journals and more contribution to the space from a global standpoint, not happening locally. So I'd like to throw the question out there to our representatives from our universities. What it is that can we do as a nation to foster that kind of development, especially from an earlier stage with our, our, our younger ones to facilitate this trajectory for persons to be interested in technological fields and not just technology, but cybersecurity. So I start with Dr. Busby and then on to Dr. Manting. Yes, um, Giovanni, if, if I might, however, just make a comment on some of the things that uh, Major Barkley, if you don't mind calling long time, it's been a number of years, nice to see you again. Um, we all know each other at least in, in, in our, I can't even see your previous life, but some years ago. 
um, that, that those comments you made on bug bounties and in particular what the current cyber crimes act states in terms of unauthorized access and so i i fundamentally disagree and let, let me explain why at, at the moment <clears throat> what you describe calling exists um, whether it is a researcher whether it is a professional practitioner we are able to engage and to conduct um, tests whether it be penetration tests whether it be some other form of consultation and contracts and so can be written up what does not exist however is something in the act that allows for let's call it accidental discovery of these types of flaws and that now actually can be criminalized under this current act as it stands and that's dangerous the act should be more encompassing we're not saying that um, someone who wishes to engage in certain types of activities shouldn't consult an organization or an individual, but there have been numerous cases where solely in um, traversing or engaging or interacting with a company's publicly facing um, website or, or electronic presence has encountered a flaw. Nothing will be reported because there is the fear of being held liable or to be, be labeled a criminal for doing so. What also exists, unfortunately, seems to be more in line with how we communicated in, in the past, in that things were handwritten, things were typed, and to give consent involved someone signing a document or someone stating specifically that a, B, C, and D is what will be allowed. We are, however, in a digital age. And in that digital age, we work with privileges. And so we, as owners of a resource, have to ensure that if we are making any aspect of a resource publicly available, that that resource must be adequately protected. It's not solely the responsibility of someone who may not have access to it to gain access. It is the responsibility of the owner to the best of their ability to ensure that those resources are adequately secured. Otherwise, we find ourselves in the position where we in know where the act does not actually accommodate such a scenario. And therefore anyone can be held potentially criminal, I'm sorry, can be held responsible for it and can have criminal charges laid against them and that does not encourage the type of environment in the cybersecurity space that we want. If we want to encourage and engender innovation and to also strengthen and harden our resources and our assets, then we have to have some sort of, uh, and don't, don't take it um, too, too specifically, uh, more of an open policy. It's, it's along the lines of open source and, and allowing others, the more who can analyze and provide different perspectives, the, the, the more secure things will be. We still have to accept the fact that there are going to be some who have a malintent. We can't avoid it. The laws have been there. They haven't provided it. They haven't, sorry, prevented it. It hasn't been prevented in other realms. Why should we expect that it will be prevented in the cybersecurity space either? What we have to do is ensure that the laws permit the sort of innovation and investigation that we want to help grow the sector, to help grow the, the, the research and the type of innovation and intellectual capability that we want, but still have that line where we can cleanly and, and clearly demarcate where active and passive or nefarious and good intent can be seen and we can encourage a type of um, growth. Sorry if I if I um, went a bit off. And if I may, off, I I'd, I'd like to respond to Curtis. Um, conceptually, I don't disagree with your sentiments, um, but interestingly, the unauthorized access uh, provision uh, for Jamaica it doesn't um, divert much from other jurisdiction. They, it's, and I mean, I do understand the fear of um, being prosecuted and technically, if it is that one shares a password based on how they, they 
the provision is framed, then you can be liable to prosecution. And the issue is how enforceable it is and you know, as to what extent there are certain things that will lead to the court. So I say this to say that one, um, our legislation is not so different from other jurisdictions. What I am focusing on is saying that, you know what, other jurisdiction has created or provided creative ways to not um, see the legislation for what it is as a restriction and facilitate um, instead of government led initiatives, it is privately led initiatives to ensure that we can achieve the outcomes for which you had outlined uh, earlier, the innovation, the actual active investigations and search. And you know, with all of that, and once it's within that framework, then um, the actors, ethical actors and researchers can be rest assured that there won't be any risk of prosecution because they're working within this um, privately led policy framework. Understandably, I mean, for example, the US, yes, admittedly, they are moving towards a more government um, led initiative now where you have, for example, as I outlined before, CISO, looking at their coordinated vulnerability disclosure programs that helps to assist that. So the law sometimes works a bit behind, but it's important for us not to see it as a hindrance and more as an opportunity to utilize different um, measures to achieve the outcome for which we desire. Well, I, I also agree Pauline, that there are a number of territories that have similar types of, of laws, legislation, acts and the like. We, I know before we uh, enacted ours, even within the region, there are um, countries like Trinidad, like the Bahamas and so on that had their own. But, and, and we in some way, form or fashion, model some of, of, of the bits of ours from theirs and from others like in, 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 in the UK and so on. But we can come up with our own, we can be, sorry to use this, this term, we can, we can lead in one respect. They, they, we would also um, like to ensure, as I said, yes, we can leave it open to companies and to the private sector and so on to make their own judgment calls with, with respect to certain flaws being identified and so on. But as Bunjan said earlier, and I totally agree, the culture here is that we don't report. The culture here is that we have very little data about what happens within Jamaica and the wide Caribbean region. We have lots of data about the types of attacks, the frequency of attacks, the nature of the, the, the um, the origin of attacks for North America, for Europe, for Asia, for Asia, Asia, sorry, for South America, but nothing here. That's one of the things I, have, I really have been hoping for as a, a service from Jusert, for example. But all of this would help to change that culture that already exists here. And the government and its acts could, in at least, my preference would be, and I believe it's a preference for many in the in the environment, to act more as a oversight or guiding body, not to get down into, into the weeds as, as to how things should happen and where they should happen. And how it is defined at the moment, I think is a bit too um, poorly defined considering the, the area or the domain that we're in. But then it looks like you have something that you also want to contribute. Let me not have the time. <laughs> you know, between both of you, I had so many thoughts in my mind that when it now comes my turn, I'm losing it. Um, but very, you know, it's um, research is also about inquiry. So if our undergrad students are going on to become to do postgrad and to do research, they need that inquiring mind. Let's just take as an example, you know, the jam COVID scenario that we had. And I'm just um, you know, saying that how we would now analyze that. 
So during that, uh, first of all, I don't, I, I mean, I don't know how it, how the person went about trying to find the vulnerabilities in Jam COVID specifically, or was it something that you know the, the that group was running as you know as a, a scan of everything that is vulnerable and happened to find an instance of us as a Jam COVID as an instance of having vulnerabilities. Then at, at that instance, I remember several of our students with the inquiring mind were you know, started looking also because after it was said that everything was secure, I remember several of our undergrad students trying to, um, you know, explore and see the knowledge that they have gained as to how, what they could do. And they did tumble on, you know, certain things. As I was informed as the head from one of my other colleagues. Suddenly I looked on my phone and I had data and I was horrified. I'm like, oh my God, like, you know, it's that, that fear of prosecution, even though the law says maybe I've done nothing wrong, maybe just be just trying to be a, a helpful head of the department to my, to my colleagues and to my students. But even I felt fear. And then I called Lieutenant Colonel and at least tried to get from him the process, what our students could take. But I don't know how many of them, I didn't know who they were and I didn't know how many of them actually went down the path of reporting it. But these same students who were, who were inquisitive in their mind, you know, it's that inquisitiveness. How do we now channel that to make them to really start doing a research degree in security? Because obviously they were good or they were, you know, quite capable in terms of tools to get started. So, it's the, I mean, I do take your point that, you know, the authorization and all this is needed, but what I also get from the security personnel is that often you are doing it in an open space and you, you stumble upon things and then what do you do? There's a fear. And that fear is very important to eliminate that fear if we want to create a culture of research in cybersecurity, along with data, of course. Data is a very, very important, you know, the infrastructure is very important, but the fear of making sure that you're not going to be prosecuted. I think a colleague of mine had mentioned that he was on a site and he did he, he entered some things. And if you enter some special characters, it is seen as a SQL injection. And nowadays the truth is, you know, you're with poor eyesight as you get on to, you know, after 50, you're probably not able to see the key, keyboard and you could enter certain things. And I can see Curtis laughing because he calls me old all the time. Um, now, if I make an error like that and I'm exposed to a page with people's passwords, have I done something wrong? Do I feel, am I going to be... Uh, you know, prosecuted for that, even just the fear of that, even though as the laws may or may not, you know, be applied or maybe what may happen, but we have to eliminate that for our researchers to overcome that. And hence, I think as, um, as if Curtis was to get more students in his lab to do research, and if he was to get more data, I think we will have a much more thriving research culture in cybersecurity. Another important thing to note that I think of even actually not just cybersecurity, but any technology, it is so fast evolving, you know, it's adaptive, it's just, at, and it's evolving at a quantum speed that if we just focus on what operations we are doing now, we will be far behind very soon. So we need that research happening so that we are living in that dynamic world and we in Jamaica, we're able to keep up with the dynamic nature of this uh, change. And, and hence research will become critical. And if I may, uh, I jump in and um, I'm not providing legal advice here, um, although I do wear many hats. Uh, but the issue is the accidental um, exposure. Arguably, uh, a bad faith actor can use that, um, you know, that defense. So we have to be mindful as to, yes, we, we have good intentions as to where we want to see the law, uh, the law to be as expansive as possible. But sometimes it may not be as easy as one would think. And that's why it is so important for us to focus on the objective for which we want and to find ways, probably as I am trying to reiterate, outside of the legal measures, um, to consider to ensure that we actually is able to minimize the fare and to actually actively investigate in, in, in the space. Because the bottom line is that um, the bad faith actors will use this opportunity if it is that our laws are too open. And especially when it is outside of the framework for which Budapest Convention, um, for example, may have. Unauthorized access is, um, you know, it's a common 
use the term. And unfortunately for us in Jamaica, we don't tend to test our law as much. And probably that will help to eliminate some fear if it is that we are able to test the law, but then that brings up so many other issues. So the point that I'm making is that I do recognize the concerns and um, I'm on the side of appreciating them, but also I recognize that given that there are other avenues for which we can utilize to achieve our active cybersecurity research and investigation and inquiry, I think you know, we can best utilize those until um, you know, we have less bad faith actors, maybe. Pauline, I, I, I'm sorry again, but a bad faith actor is going to continue to prove they're not going to stop if they accidentally come upon something. For one, is not necessarily going to be accidental. And if it is, they're going to take measures to actively engage to try to probe further and get further into a system. That, that's what they're there for. And, and a company, an individual who is aware of, of, of security related concerns would be able to see, you know, even looking at audit logs, looking at the behavior of that individual of someone with ill intent is significantly different from one who happens upon something accidentally. It is a stark and significant difference. I, I don't disagree with you either that some having been discovered might try to use that avenue to try to get themselves out, out of the hot water that they may find themselves in. But generally speaking, I do not think that um, someone who accidentally comes up in, in, into contact with something, and this is from, as Gunjan also uh, made mention of, the, the numerous individuals, students and otherwise who have happened upon things, or who have happened upon accidentally finding. And even in some of those cases, they were curious, but didn't realize how poorly configured or how poorly built something was. And it's until that happens that they then decide, oh, wait, stop, I've, 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 I've found something that I know I shouldn't have. And they will contact me and ask, sir, what am I to do? I found this, I've gotten this bunch of data. I really and truly didn't mean to. It's something that they, they truly, their curiosity got the better of them, but it was not for an intent. And I, I and understand, understand Curtis, and I mean, we want to make sure that we don't criminalize that kind of activity. And I do also. And I don't point, think that is criminalized. Yes, but the thing is, a company could, in 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 trying to secure and to ensure that their organization maintains its good name and, and others, right? Other things, a company or an individual could very well take the law as it stands and begin proceedings. There's nothing stopping that from happening. And I am sure the university will support, um, you know, court proceedings and being able to test the law, maybe to even the privy council. I'm just saying that's the point. That is how laws are created too. <laughs> so, um, you know, once that happens, we can, you know, as I said, yes, there are going to be both sides of both types of companies. One who's going to fix it and one who said, no, 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 I'm going to prosecute. But uh, I just feel that, well, I just have a different perspective in terms of the law, and I just am convinced that there are alternative measures for which we need to leverage, um, especially now, to be able to move forward in achieving uh, the research objectives. So, Dr. Busby Earl, based on the discussions that I'm having here, um, and, and, and a question jumped out at me, what, and I know you are not from a legal background, um, but what legal, what adjustments would you like to see be made to the law that can accommodate or facilitate more of these research-based ethical hacking um, without the fear of getting into trouble with the law? Uh, and, and then I would appreciate if, 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 if Major Barclay could answer and to, to let us know if that's possible or is that something in the works. So over to you, Dr. Busby. Sure. So what we had suggested or recommended to the Joint Select Committee is along the lines of changing the definition of what unauthorized access is 
to be more reflective of the current environment in which we operate, which would mean um, defining it in such a way, and, I, and you're quite right, I can't come up with the adequate or proper legal terminology, but the technical, to use our word terms, would involve the inclusion of this idea of privilege and assigning correct privileges to resources and how the devices that operate on our behalf, whether it be a smartphone or a laptop or machine, how they go about negotiating authorization and access to those resources should form a part of it. This is not just exclusively for research, even though that's a topic today. The, that's, however, will certainly be one of the possible outcomes in being able to engender that kind of community, that kind of, of environment. But it also would seek to decriminalize some of the actions that, as the act stands today, could easily be construed as a criminal act. And so it is in particular this idea of privilege, the, um, the discussion, let's call it that, or the, the exchange between machines that are operating on all behalf of processes in terms of determining who has access to what resources and what sort of access they have, something along those lines has to be included in the act. If I may just add to that, Curtis, I think we had a long discussion whether, you know, if someone is, um, there's layers of protection if someone is violating those. You know, if, yeah. if a company has set up protection layers and if someone is violating that, then we can see it as somebody doing something wrong. But if there are, if that protection is not there and someone can just walk in, then is it really violating anything? And I think that was the uh, unauthorized access, the word unauthorized access, trying to define that. We can do it in a technical terminology, but I think uh, you know the yeah. legal uh, experts need to tell how to now define that as to what is really unauthorized access. And, it's a, and it is a, a, an appropriate um, designation of access. Yeah, and it is also to ensure that some of the burden of responsibility is on the owner of the resources. There is no designation as the, as the law, as the act stands, where we can easily see that the burden was on or could be seen to have placed on the owner of the resource to ensure that these security measures have been in place. When you look at parts A, B, and C of where it describes what an authorized access is, it basically says, well, if the person who is deemed to have made this unauthorized access, does not have consent or does not have um, consent based on the, the act as it stands. And I can't remember what part A was now, but it's along the lines of what the person who has um, accessed this resource, how they went about doing it, as opposed to any description that will entail uh, the owner of the resource having implemented some form of access control or privilege designation to the resource to indicate to anyone in that public space that, look, this particular resource is restricted in this way or the other. Uh, I, I, can I just say something here, Giovanni? Uh, I know we are focusing on the Cyber Crimes Act as an enabler for making research happen, but we also should, you know, that's just one of the pillars, if I would say. I think another aspect is also data. And how do we, as a collectively in Jamaica, what do we do? What, is, what role does JASR play? What role does, you know, the legislation plays? What role do the ad, uh, academic institutions play? And the society also, I think everyone in society also has to play roles, all the private sector companies so that we can really build that database of uh, incidences in Jamaica, so which will then enable more research to happen. I, so I, I, I hear the points that you're making and, uh, and I'm not sure, and I'll go back to you, Major Barclay, because I'd like to know if, if the recommendations given are legal and sound or if they're possible, but, and, and as we discuss, thoughts and ideas are popping in mind. And to Dr. Gunjan and Dr. Um, 
Busby, would it be possible if there is almost like a setup of a council of ethical hackers or whatever group you would like, and they operate within a specific scope to get you the necessary data that is needed to facilitate this research. And this group would be identified under the law as, hey, you can operate within this sphere, but you have to be registered to this group in order to do this. Outside of the group, we will, um, we will be charging you full blown to the law. Is that something that you think, first of all, is it something that is there or is it something that's um, being discussed? And do you think that is something that would be um, feasible? I leave that to Curtis. <laughs> well, um, before I answer, Giovanni, uh, I believe Pauline had been invited to provide a response. I don't want to assume all of the bandwidth with regard to the law and what we were suggesting included with regard to revising the definition of unauthorized access. Okay, uh, I will commit, but uh, I would prefer not to be speaking as an attorney at law today, uh, maybe more as a policymaker, but um, the, the suggestions, I think, um, and before I go there, uh, there's a recent um, case in the US or it was um, held in the Supreme Court as to a policeman, he had access to his accounts, but he went beyond what was considered authorized. He was able to access um, some things that were not for the purpose of his, of his work um, normally. On the face of it, one would say, yes, he's authorized, but no, it may seem or perceive that he was unauthorized, although he may have had privilege to access that database. So, uh, when we consider the policy, it can be a slippery slope and we have to consider all the scenarios um, as to whether or not a good actor or bad actor can see. So yes, you will have the technical um, response in terms of having the necessary associated as, um, identity management and access control and privileges and all of that. But I mean, everything is um, breakable. Uh, but in terms of our law specifically, it talks about being entitled to doing something. And it also talks about um, particular persons who have functions and powers. And it also talks about um, consent. And those, I think those are reasonable components so which one can gain authority or authorization to, to conduct good faith um, research, because again, we, we heading back to the vulnerability disclosure policies, those things cannot be minimized because um, whether or not it's before an activity is um, upon or after, maybe it is that we need to educate um, both government and public sector, I mean, government and private sectors to the possibilities and academia to the possibility what a vulnerability disclosure programs um, can offer and see that you know what we perceive as limitations are actually not so, because what are being proposed currently in terms of the law, uh, they can prove problematic for persons with, um, well, not, not problematic, but actually easy defenses for persons who have not so good intentions. So that is my submission, Giovanni. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I appreciate the response. Uh, so we ha I'm being informed now that our final panelist is joining us at this time, and he is Damian Cox from the Ministry of, I think, Education, Youth and Information. Um, at this time, I will just bring in Mr. Cox um, to give a brief introduction, and I hope he got some portions of the discussion that we've been having so far and, and what contributions he would have to that discussion. Mr. Cox? Hi, thank you, Giovanni, and good afternoon, all. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I, 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 I'm loving the discussion. I think I just want to just jump in and, and participate. Um, I think there, there is a concern of 
scope creep, um, depending on, on, on what you would say you would allow um, legislatively. Um, but I think there has to be a recognition, and I think there is, that we need to strengthen the legislative framework. And I think while some persons, the assessment of our legislative framework, it was, it was, it was good, it was okay. But I think we can all recognize that what has happened in terms of um, cybersecurity and cybercrime in, in the last few years only has clearly indicated that the, 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 the legis legislative architecture and framework and the policies to support that need some, some, some serious modernization. And I think you, there are, there are, when it comes to the incident reporting, I think that ha that's, that's something that um, you would want to look at strongly as a part of the legislative framework. If you look at what's, um, if you look at what's happening in the States or, in, or, in, or in, in, in the US and Europe, the modernization of the legislation, those are, are key um, parts of that. Um, I would also want to say that the, I think there's a, there's a general concern about um, who should be respons responsible for, let's say, um, certain countermeasures, right? Which what the concern for states is that that should be a, a state responsibility, right? But in terms of um, identifying um, attackers and taking um, certain active measures, there has to be a framework that would allow for, for, for some reasonable actions to be taken and reported to law, law enforcement, right? Um, so, for me, I think it, the, the legislation requires specific provisions on um, accreditation of, and certification, uh, licensing of cybersecurity providers, because that also would um, lend um, some support to the development of the industry and the identifi identification of, of legitimate um, actors as well. Uh, specific provisions on, on a number of areas like um, social engineering, um, you know, def defining certain things like cyber cybersecurity practitioner, um, cybersecurity products, cybersecurity um, service providers, um, cybersecurity professionals. I think when you when you have a comprehensive legislative architecture that defines things and identifies who are legitimate um, um, actors, it, it it it's it's going to assist in, in, in ensuring that you can clearly say who, who, are, who are persons on, 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 on the wrong side of, of, of legislative um, intent and those who are on the right side of legislative intent. And I think there's no um, getting around that. I think we need to define, um, designate what, what is uh, critical infrastructure, right? Information infrastructure and the duties of the owners of that infrastructure uh, so there, there's a lot of modernization that needs to happen. And I, and I think um, the, 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 the loophole that may be there in terms of the, the, the legislation, um, I think you don't want to leave um, actor actions just to interpretation. Um, but if you, if, if for example, you're talking about um, countermeasures, if, if, if someone were to get the, because the issue comes down to consent, if you were to get consent from a, from a, from a, from a bad actor to, to access um, that his, his, his system, then, you know, they, they, it's more than likely that you wouldn't have a, have a problem, right? But I think we need to modernize the, 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 the cyber crimes um, legislative framework. Um, as well as the strategy, which is underway, as, as we know. Giovanni, if I may, um, sure. I'd like to respond to certain uh, comments um, made by Mr. Cox. Sure, you can. Okay, well, first, I would say that 
some of the concerns raised are being addressed in the draft um, national cybersecurity strategy, for example, the issue of critical infrastructure protection and the issue of um, having minimum baseline security standards for doing business with government um, and general business in general are things that would address some of the concerns. Um, additionally, uh, in terms of incident reporting, we have made steps in terms of the Data Protection Act. It has, uh, it contemplates uh, when it actually becomes um, in operation that in the event of security breach, you have the organization has a responsibility to report to the Data Protection um, uh, Commissioner and also to, depending on the type of breach, also to the data subject. So we're making steps in, in that regard. Obviously, there are other opportunities for different types of security breaches that may not have been contemplated in that, and the Cybersecurity Act um, or Cybercrime Act may actually help with that. But at the same time, you know, one of the things that is also being considered is developing that culture for where voluntary reporting to authorities is, you know, is something that can be considered and as a responsibility, we're talking about research here, one of the responsibility too is to find out, you know, okay, why it is that we continue to have this issue. Um, Jamaica is not unique in that um, context and we have some empirical data to suggest, you know, why this continue to be a perennial problem. But, um, but yes, it's, it continues to be exciting and some of the, the concerns, I believe, are, are currently being addressed. In the issue of consent, um, the legislative drafters tend to be or try to be precise in their policy as possible and consent technically cannot be from a bad act. Act it has to be from someone who's so authorized to give consent. I will allow the other panelists to, to come in. Well, I, I agree with a, a lot of what Mr. Cox had said, uh, in fact, in our letter to the Joint Select Committee, we had also included a bit of information on our concerns with regard to the designation of uh, sort of the, the, the secured um, types of, of data or, and, and, and devices um, classified. I can't remember the, the exact term, but it was along the lines of what Mr. Cox was saying. And I, we wholeheartedly agree that the act and some of the, the other bits of legislation need to be revised. And I know that they are in the process of doing so. So we're very much in support of doing so and looking forward to their um, future term, I heard earlier, modernization. Um, Giovanni, if I may just add something, um, I know all these experts have spoken, they are more cybersecurity experts than I am, so I won't get in there. Um, but uh, the question that you asked earlier, which was... Uh... Yes, I was waiting to answer that one too. Sorry, I have four dogs in my room because of thunder and I'm just trying to get them out and nobody in my house is responding to me. One of the issues of working from home. Um, but uh, the issue I was saying is that, you know, you spoke about the fact that we have, uh, who, how can we go about collecting that data? How does the legislation help us? How do the professional bodies help us? How do the academic institution help us? I think we need to really think that, think that allowed come through a process as to how the data collection in the local context increases and improves. Um, and we have persons, you know, in all academic institutions who are working on doing some kind of, uh, you know, like let's say they're doing penetration testing or even trying some different environments and collecting that data and, and create an enabling environment where people are more likely to um, report on these things. So uh, I, I don't know what the right answer is, but I think we need to bring other stakeholders in this conversation. I don't know about the right answer, Gundam, but thanks for bringing us back to it. I, I was waiting to, to answer Giovanni's um, question. And my, my initial thought and answer was back when the discussions were being held, which eventually resulted in the establishment of just cert as the national incident response team. One of the 
initial ideas and overarching themes was that various organizations and individuals would feel free to share information with that national um, entity. Now, the information, of course, would be sanitized so that um, the entity could not be readily identified based on the data, but having information on whether it's been a phishing attack or a ransomware attack and the numbers that have happened, we can then start to get statistical data. I I've been looking forward to it. Um, certain um, types of reports could be made public, right? If we've had a, a hundred um, security incidents over the past month, what have they been? We don't need to know who have, have been the, the victims unless now as has been suggested, there's some sort of registration or some understanding agreement that depending on who is requesting what sort of information, the level of detail can be provided. So then we could find out uh, whether it's been in the financial sector, the manufacturing sector, what types, what's the nature of the, of the types of attacks. That was um, where, at least from my point of view, the initial or the genesis of sharing data and providing data on the local landscape in the cybersecurity domain uh, was the expectation um, from my point to, to, to start or to come from. And I'm hoping that that's still the case. Um, Giovanni had suggested or maybe creating a board of, of ethical hackers or the like, maybe in times to come, but I think we already have an entity that can certainly provide the type of information and type of data that could provide the, the basis for types of research and analysis in our space already. And that can be, can be done. It, it also helps those in the sense that when something is reported, the CERT can have solutions depending on the nature of it, if it's been seen already, how it can be addressed. And that also helps to build the, the, the type of skill that we're also looking for within the local environment. So I think JustCert has a big part to play. It is something that I recall, as I said in the early discussions, that that was one of the, the roles that they should play. And I'm still looking forward to it, even if it is, and I apologize if that's already been done, I could easily have just been under my rock in my office with those guys looking at some, some stuff and I'm just unaware of it. But if so, please let me know. I'd be, I'd love to, to have access to it. I'm joking, Curtis, and said to some extent, um, because the draft strategy actually reports on some of this um, Jamaica CERT um, statistics, and it, it provides interesting insight. Um, it highlights, for example, that private sector has been underreporting. Um, you know, it highlights issues that abusive content from individual is at a high. Um, phishing in government and malware are some of the top, um, you know, threats and security incidents. Uh, so there is there, you know, there's a start and obviously there's more that can be done, but we are making steps and I think over time we will get better. Yes, I, I wholeheartedly agree that the start is there, but I was looking forward to the sort of regular dissemination of information or maybe it can be posted on the search site where it can be accessed based on one's authorization. It's, it's, it's along the lines of becoming routine that this type of data is available. I agree with you that um, that report did provide some bit of information and it is a start. I'd like to see it continue. It, it really is, is something I'm looking forward to. I concur with that because one of the, the issues that we highlight is that a lack of data-driven analysis and for us to be able to do so, for which Gunjan is passionate about, we need to have data and yes. the have to be able to be willing to share that data. So the more data we have, the better informed we can be to you know, provide solutions for our environment. Yes. And if I may just add something to that journey, totally unrelated to meaning what um, Curtis and Carlena are saying, 
but in terms of you know the importance of data as we move forward in research world because as we create our own data sets you know everyone speaks about machine learning big data deep learning these are some of the terms which the which are there in the tech industry and we can't start talking about those things until we don't have our data we can't have our students working on the local data you know data sets as curtis's own student used some uh, botnet's data from canada didn't he curtis yes um, and I remember the external examiner who was from somewhere in, in, in uh, Europe asking him, uh, where was the data set from? You know, that was like any time and people are doing research, that data set becomes very important. And as a data scientist, I think we really need to work towards it so that we can, and maybe not just in Jamaica, maybe in Jamaica, we will never make that big picture, but maybe as collectively as Caribbean. And uh, so, because I'm sure, um, you know, I mean, these problems are not just unique to data, to uh, Jamaica. And if we can share what we are doing with that data with our other Caribbean nations, then we would build a much richer, um, you know, resource. And that will help not just uh, fighting uh, cybercrime in Jamaica, but in the entire Caribbean. Uh, Gunjan, I'm on the same page. And I think, um, you know, it's a cultural, our shift because until we see information sharing as less as a threat and more of an opportunity to learn and better un understand what we're doing, then we'll continue to have these challenges. And uh, I suppose this is where we need the private sector, government, and leadership to appreciate that you know what, the more information we share, sanitized, of course, then the better able we can to have the solutions that fit our environment. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. Um, I, I, I like the direction which the conversation has taken so far, but I'd like to just vary a bit of the legislative portion of the discussion and, 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 and ask what is the level of maturity that we are as a nation um, where cybersecurity is concerned and um, that can lead to any unfettered pain testing. And one of the reasons when I think about readiness, I also think about maturity uh, because there needs to be some level of maturity when you're thinking about being ready to do something. So I'll start with um, Dr. Gunjan and then we take the rest of the panelists um, as to where they see the maturity of Jamaica as a nation where cybersecurity is concerned. You want me to start at the lower level from a primary, secondary, and going on to tertiary and our general population. But every time I, I see my students in first year, first time they're doing computing, and especially my students who are doing AI, I tell them one thing, go see some movies in technology. One example is uh, The Great Hack. The other one is Social Dilemma. These are just some of the things that are possible with data, right? And hence that will enable people to say that what is possible with these things and the truth is whatever is possible, as the possibilities increase, the security risks also increase because that means you are sharing more and more and hence there is more that is uh, accessible. Um, I don't even know if you saw, there was uh, a few days ago, there was it was reported that Argentina's entire national ID database was stolen. Um, and I was horrified to even see that, that, um, you know, the, if we, we cannot even imagine something like this happening in our local NIDS. That would be like, a, it, it would be just corrosion of all kind of trust that the citizens have with the government. So we need, we need that maturity in place and we need, need that maturity at all levels from every young child that is on a phone or on a tablet or, you know, sharing the data and or, or making the devices accessible uh, to others. I think we we need that awareness going right from from that primary, secondary, and then that I can speak a little bit. I don't know what is happening on those levels, and I think we need to work on those levels also. Uh, general population, what should be the cybersecurity? Uh, you know knowledge. I remember one of my colleagues who teaches a system admin course as he posted in one of our uh, WhatsApp groups, uh, which is, you know, our faculty as to how do you set a password? And it's like most people were struggling to come up with the right answer, or they may know the right answer, but to actually follow that in real life is a nightmare. Um, just even, you know, how you set your passwords, a simple thing, which I think would be a 101 for security people. 
Now, that kind of awareness we need to build. Now, at the tertiary level institution, we try and put that awareness and security, or that's what we are now attempting to do in all our courses, you know, all related courses, be it networking, be it databases, be it system and be it information systems and organizations, or specialized courses, which I will let Kurt to speak about because that's the course he teaches. Um, so, you know, security isn't everything that we do. So it's not just we need a cybersecurity expert. There's one job of an expert. I think any technology person, any technology who is either creating software or managing software or implement, you know, putting together a network, they all need to know about some aspects of security. So we need that capacity. And then again, in the postgrad levels, higher level and research higher levels. And I won't, I won't speak to that because I think that is something that Curtis can speak better to since he's the one who manages those aspects. Um, so okay. I, I, that's my take on it, Joanne, about the, the capacity that we need to build. And it's, it has to be you know, in everything we do in our technology space, and not just as a specialized cybersecurity, which it will become later, of course. There are different levels of competencies. Thank yeah, you, so Dr. Busby. Yes, thank you, Giovanni. So in terms of maturity, as you asked, uh, from, I think, two sides. There's the side of government and, and other um, similar entities, and there's the Jamaican public. And as Gunjan was saying, the Jamaican public has to include children, children coming up through our educational system. I know, for example, that in primary schools and prep schools, children are writing code in Python and in other languages. And, and therefore, they will be even more familiar and comfortable with writing code and exploring and curiosity and, and the like. When our students come to us at the university level, the vast majority of them are already aware and knowledgeable of security threats and flaws and some of the tools that can be used for, um, I use the term exploration loosely, right? And so in terms of the general Jamaican public, I think that maturity is there. They are also aware of the fact that you can acquire so many tools and platforms that are related to cybersecurity or penetration testing or simple curiosity freely on the internet. Many are aware of not just the internet, but of the dark web and many of the other things that are, are associated. Uh, those in the professional security field are also aware, and the vast majority who I interact with, and many of them are past students, are desirous of contributing and helping to strengthen Jamaica's cybersecurity space. So they're they're not so keen on on hacking for for malicious purposes. They want and understand that we need to develop Jamaica's cyberspace and they want to contribute. They want to be able to do these things without, as we had been discussing earlier, fear of some sort of um, some, some repercussions. In terms of the government and other oversight entities, I think that that maturity is getting possibly to a, a point where we are a little bit more comfortable. So the revision, as we've talked about with regard to the act, the um, coming implementation of the National Identity Identification System, the Data Privacy Act, uh, the other acts and so on, the um, adoption of the currencies, the ministries and other related entities moving a lot of their services online. I think that maturity has also improved and increased. And so I think that, yes, we are at a stage where it's not so much that we want to encourage unfettered access or behavior. We just would like to encourage, which may be as a consequence, uh, the type of curiosity or innovation or um, contribution, but with the overarching guidelines to draw the line as to what is or could be constituted as constructive as opposed to destructive. We can't avoid it, this will happen. Um, and it doesn't have to happen from someone here in Jamaica. 
the reason why many in the professional space want to also help and contribute is because they know and understand that many of their tax flow come from outside of Jamaica. And it's because of the love of the island and what we're trying to do that we also believe that we can take on anybody. And we probably can because of the, the nature of our natural skills and intellect and creativity and so on. We want to put that to, to, to use. And so I do think that the maturity from both sides has certainly improved. It may not um, be at the point where we want to, or I don't think it will ever be at the point where you want to allow unfettered um, activity. We just want to create an environment where we are fostering a certain type of creativity while at the same time um, limiting or at least trying to, as we try to do in the security field, make it a bit more challenging for those who have ill intent to accomplish what they're doing without repercussion. Thank you, Dr. Bosby. Um, let me go to Mr. Cox first and then I'll take Major Barkley after. Mr. Cox? Thanks, Giovanni. I, I, I think we are maturing. Um, I, I think there, there, there is a, a growing recognition of the, of, the, of the significance of the issue. Um, but I think we need um, to understand, I think that what's happening um, globally, it's not waiting for us to come to a, a consensus position that um, these are critical issues. It, it, it's something that we have to the hackers are not waiting for us to, to, get, to get ourselves in a certain position. So we have to be leaning forward into, into a, a posture that, that I think we are recognizing where we need to go. Um, but personally, I think, I think we, we, we should be moving a little bit um, faster with the things that we need to get, get done. Um, that, 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 is, that is just the, the, the reality of the threat. Is, is, is so significant to both business and government. Um, I know that, that the government is taking it very seriously. I know private sector is taking it seriously. Um, but we just need to put uh, the, all the, 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 the architecture in place to ensure that we can um, be able to uh, address the risk in as robust a fashion as possible. Thank you, Major Barkley. Thank you, Giovanni. Um, I think um, I agree with some of the sentiments that have been shared and one is in relation to, Curtis, I finally agree with you concerning unfettered, um, in particular to the question as to unfettered access to claim testing, for example. I, I don't, uh, that is not prudent. Uh, and this is where the law would come in because we can't have unfettered access to certain things, but uh, we can have unfettered access to learning, certainly. Uh, in terms of our maturity, uh, generally speaking, the, the global indices tend to show that we are somewhat um, maybe stagnating, essentially. Uh, we were making moves probably five um, years ago when the 2015 strategy came into being. But for example, the Global Cybersecurity Index um, from ITU showed that we have not a very good level or show a very good level of commitment to um, cybersecurity. But interestingly, um, the legal component always seemed to, to, to be high. So we tend to have a strong legislative measures despite the, you know, the perception that it is not necessarily so. And of course, there's always opportunities um, to, to, to fix that. And it's also important for us to, I mean, if we are to be serious about cybersecurity, we have to ensure that it's not only a technical discussion, uh, the human component, um, you know, the public, whomever they are, they are the weakest vectors and social engineering uh, will continue to be a profitable and um, useful measure to get that. So we have to continue to build um, 
uh, public education and awareness um, to, and until we're able to do that, you know, it's a continuous process, uh, then our security profile, our maturity level, we can't really say that it is where it should be. But notwithstanding that, we continue to grow in different areas and the legal measures seem to be one of our strongest measures when we look at the indices globally. Thank you, Major Barclay. Um, I, 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 we, we are wrapping up nicely. And uh, let me say thank you to all our panelists today that came and uh, gave us a fruitful discussion. And I do hope that our listeners uh, gained some new insight and new knowledge um, through this discussion. As we close off today's session, I am going to give each of our panelists five minutes to give a closing statement, and then we officially close off today's session. And I am still seeing Major Barkley, so I'll start with Major Barkley and then take it from there. So Major Barkley, you can give your closing statements and then we continue through to the rest of our panelists. Thank you, Giovanni. Um, and I think I'll just continue on where I left off in the last discussion, really, about the importance of recognizing that cybersecurity is not a technical um, concern more and more, as we see in other jurisdiction. Yes, it's important, but it's, it's necessary, but not sufficient in our, um, you know, search for, for measures to address our cybersecurity risks. So that is important. Um, in looking at what we need to do, public education is important. And also we require somewhat of a cultural shift. It's gonna be difficult, but we need to try. Um, you know, we have to have active collaboration with all our stakeholders that include the private and the public sector um, for us to be able to understand and appreciate the importance of research. I think that is one of the things that we're probably lacking or is not necessarily sufficient in Jamaica. Uh, many um, countries value research and they see that it drives innovation and they see that innovation means greater economic benefit. So when we're doing our research and we want the support of private or even public sectors as academia, um, it is difficult to get that support. So I would love to be able to see a greater shift towards supporting, um, you know, scientific research, ethical research as a means to having our country um, see development. And also uh, the development of the private vulnerability disclosure programs. Uh, this is something that both private and public sector can pursue as we seek to manage um, you know, good faith actors as they pursue their intent of trying to minimize security risks um, for us. So in short, I would say the policy and culture shift um, are needed to propel the cybersecurity research industry. And while a legislative shift would be helpful, it is not necessarily a prohibitive factor at this stage. Thank you, Giovanni. Thank you, Major Barclay. Uh, Dr. Manzing? I'm happy you gave it to me before the others in case <laughs> I ran out of thoughts what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> um, okay. I see cybersecurity world in, in a both, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a big picture person because I'm looking for trends and patterns all the time. So I see it in a horizontal fashion and I see it in a vertical fashion. And I'll tell you what I mean from horizontal fashion that to me it is multidisciplinary. Um, even in the technology realm, you know, when we think of a software engineer or if we think of a network engineer, it is a specialized technology expertise that those people will tend to have. But for me, a cybersecurity cyber expert uh, will need to have knowledge of, you know, flavors of all aspects of technology. So it is very much pervasive kind of, a, you know, the horizontal layer. Then if I was to take a look at, and even soft skills, I think that we had spoken about earlier that people need to have all kinds of skills if they were a cybersecurity professional. Then I like to take a look at the vertical layer because everyone needs to know about cybersecurity, but it is at what levels and what depth do people need to know? So I'm happy when Damien said, you know, in our schools, we have that kind of awareness. Are we, we are putting things in place to have that kind of awareness. Everyone is going to soon have a tablet. With the broadband, everybody will be on the network. 
will be on internet. And um, so that's a basic assumption we are working with. So are, is, is everyone aware of that, aware of some aspects of security at the lower level? Then there is a whole world of upskilling, you know, be it our BPO sector, our all other sectors which are trying to upskill persons in this area. The certifications that we have in there, very important for us to know that certification is about operations. And as the field becomes dynamic, either you go and recertify you know, that's and that requires a lot more money to be in place, or you have to have the capability to really move up yourself. And hence, then that, that comes the layer of academia where you're getting that, you know, that training or not just training, I should say, I wouldn't say it's all about skills, but you also get the knowledge, you get the knowledge to evolve with the discipline. And in academia at tertiary levels, I think you have undergrad disciplines and you also have postgrad and research disciplines, which create that dynamic, which, you know, will help Jamaica deal with the dynamic environment of cybersecurity and not just cybersecurity, I would say the change in technology that pace, we will need all those capabilities. So we have to, when we're thinking of cybersecurity, we have to take a lateral and a vertical approach towards it. That's my take on it, Giovanni. Thank you, Dr. Manzing. Uh, Mr. Cox, your closing remarks. Uh, thanks, Giovanni. I, I would endorse everything that was said about um, culture. Um, we need to build a, a robust cybersecurity um, culture. We have, we have to work on um, continued ongoing work on in terms of awareness. I, I think we closing the cybersecurity skills gap, um, including the, the, the pen testing skills gap is, is going to be important. Uh, at the, the importance of data, of course, is going to be very important. Um, safety, training, um, audit trails and reporting around, around some of those activities. And uh, I, again, you know, strengthening the, the legislative framework, um, ensuring that there are guidelines in place, um, empower, empowering the cert in, 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 in a robust way, and, you know, certification of, of persons um, operating in, in the cybersecurity arena, vetting of vendors, and just, um, the critical in terms of the reporting um, and, and the standards for that, and just do the, the ongoing work on that public-private um, partnership um, that, that is essential as we go forward um, it, um, to, to try and address the issues that we've faced. Thank you, uh, Mr. Fox and Dr. Busby Earl. Thank you, Giovanni. And I would like to uh, just state my agreement with Colleen Gunjan and Mr. Cox's statements in particular, with regard to the culture change that's required that seems to be happening. Uh, the sharing of data that would help to promote uh, a research culture as well here in Jamaica. And the legislative changes that would also support many of the things that we'd like to see here. And in terms of the skills gap and the ability to equip members of our, our community, of our um, Jamaicans here, that the BWI is also um, quite ready to do so. And we have been uh, training many in the field of cybersecurity. As Gunjan correctly said, someone in cybersecurity has to have a breadth of knowledge in the domain of computing, which would include things like operating systems and systems programming and networks and cryptography and the like. And at the UWI, we offer all of those uh, in the courses at both the undergraduate and graduate levels. And yes, um, as Gunjan has said, over the years have been asked willingly in this case because it's something that I'm genuinely interested in in developing these courses and programs that are associated with it so I am looking forward to where we are heading and looking forward in the anticipation that some of these changes that we've mentioned are going to actually uh, come to fruition and finally, I'd like to say thank you very much to you, Giovanni, and your team at JustCert for inviting me to participate in today's discussion. I 
I really appreciate the opportunity that you provided. And I would also again like to congratulate you all on the work that you have been doing. And I'm also looking forward to some of the things that I had mentioned in terms of the data sharing and what is to come with your organization. So thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Busby. And a, a big thank you to all our panelists once again that took the time out to be here with us um, from JA Cert and the Ministry of Science, Energy and Technology. We appreciate the time and effort and a big thank you goes out to all of you. To our listening audience, both on uh, this Zoom platform and the live stream, we say thank you for tuning in to us today. We appreciate the air that you have given us so far. And again, we're always encouraging each and every one of you just to remember that we are all in cyberspace and we should always be safe, guys. Have yourselves a wonderful and a safe day. Thank you and goodbye to all. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you Joanne. And thank, thank you to Jessert for making these week month of activities. Thank you. Everyone and thank you.